Good morning. Good morning. Is that better? My name is Gene Mainers. I'm the uh, commander at the post, uh, Manitow Post VFW 1343. I'd like to welcome every veteran, veteran's family, distinguished guests, and all others to our Veterans Day ceremony. It's turned out to not be such a bad day at this point, so hopefully we'll get through this before uh, the weather changes on us. We'll begin the, the we'll begin the ceremony here with an invocation given by Pastor John Branch of the Cross Church. First of all, I want to say that it's an honor to be here this morning. I had the privilege of serving in the military in the United States Navy for eight years, and I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity to serve and for the opportunity to be here this morning and pray. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, we just want to praise you this morning for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, we thank you for everyone that's gathered here today, for what it represents, our men and women who have fought for our freedom. And Father, I thank you for those who gave their life. And Lord, I pray for the families that are left behind. And I pray that you'll strengthen them, Lord. And I thank you for the men that are here and the women that fought for our freedom. Lord, I believe that we've taken it for granted. And I pray that in our hearts we'll begin to pay attention to what your word says. Your word says that if we pray for those in charge, we'll live a quiet and peaceful life. Father, I believe it's Christians. We've, we've taken that for granted. And I pray, Father, that we'll begin to wake up and pray for our president and pray for those who are making decisions. And Father, I pray that we'll continue in the right direction. But thank you for the men and women that are here today that, that fought for our freedom. It means so much. And may we not take it for granted. May we not throw it to the dogs. But use it, Lord, for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor. Members of the Boy Scout Troop uh, 219 and the Fulton County Girl Scouts will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd uh, I'd like to uh, ask Mark Smiley to come up. He's the mayor of uh, Rochester, and for a little more welcoming comments. Thank you, Gene. I'd like to welcome everyone here on this very special and touching day. We are blessed to have a beautiful day we're having. Hopefully the weather holds out as Gene says. First of all, I'm honored and blessed to be here for this Veterans Day. I ask each and every one of you to take a moment and thank what the United States of America would be without our veterans. Many of us know veterans in our everyday lives, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, etc., or maybe yourself. A prayer for today is when we have no new names to mourn. Veterans Day is dedicated to honor our men and women, both living and deceased, who have served in the United States Armed Forces, whose service and sacrifice made the liberty we enjoy a reality. This day is a somber reminder of the millions of America, Americans who have fought for freedom and the more than one million have died for the cause. It is also a good time to remind ourselves that we are Americans first before we are Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, or liberals. If you are here today, you are one of the more patriotic citizens who honor our veterans for their service 
and what their comrades fell to defend. 95 years ago, in November 1919, President Wilson proclaimed November 11th as the first commemoration of Armistice Day with the following words. To us in America, the reflection of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in this country's service and with gratitude for victory, both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because the opportunity it has given us in America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of the nations. Also, there's a poem I like to read here that I think is very touching and, and by my heart, I've, I am blessed to be here, as I said, to say this and read this. In the war, there are lives risked and lives taken. Men and women giving their best to defend what they love. They defend their country, their honor, their people. Some call them soldiers. Others call them heroes. Our veterans have risked their lives for us. They have lived through hell and fought with honor. Many have been killed and many have killed and regret doing so. For every life, there is a soul. For every soul, there is a life. For those who have died, we show great appreciation and remembrance. For those who live, along with them, live the horrific memories of battle. Some memories of defeat, some memories of victory. Our veterans are more than soldiers. They were, and they still are our heroes. Our charge as we celebrate this occasion is considered these victories a step in the right direction and to harness the patriotism in our hearts today and ensure today's promise for the future is even brighter for the men and women who have given so much to make our life possible. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you remembering our veterans whose sacrifices and service have ensured our way of life. Without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over to the Master of Ceremonies again and thank you for being here today. Bless you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you coming and, uh, and giving us that uh, uh, little uh, recitation there. It was very good. Thank you. Since it's such a, well, I'm not going to call it a dreary day or a lovely day today. It's, it's kind of an in-between day, but hopefully we're going to make it through it. But the Rochester High School Band is going to play us a medley of tunes, patriotic tunes.
thank you very much, Mr. Dan Hauser and your wonderful group. They've done an excellent job. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and by the way, I'm really pleased and, and thanks for, thank you all so much for showing up. It's uh, not necessarily the worst day, but it's not always the best day either. And we have a very nice crowd here, and I really appreciate that. Now, I'd like it's my extreme pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. It's state senator for our district here of 18, Mr. Randy Head. Thank you, Commander. Uh, and I'd like to echo uh, those previous speakers who thank all of you uh, for coming here to show our veterans how much we appreciate them, their sacrifice, and the freedoms that they've helped win. I'd like to take another uh, opportunity for us to recognize the band. Please give the band another round of applause. Okay, and, and maybe more to the point of why we're gathered here today, I want you to take a look at the faces of those kids in the band. Okay, now they won't like me saying this, but take a look at how young they are. All right, now they've got their entire lives before them. They are going to be parents. They're going to be grandparents. They're going to be leaders of industry and government. Many will stay here in this community and help keep it a fantastic place to live. But look at them another time and just think, if we're fighting a war and we give them all weapons right now at this age and tell them to go fight on our behalf while we stay home. That doesn't sound like anything we'd like to be a part of. But essentially that's what we've done with generations upon generations of our veterans. The average age of the American veteran in Vietnam was 19 years old. And at all times, we turn these conflicts over to our young people, not much older than the kids in this band. That's something for us to think about today and every day. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak on this occasion. I've done it four or five times, and many times veterans will come up to me afterward and thank me for being here. And I say to them and to you, it is not you who should honor me, but me who should be honoring you, all of you, every single one. Since I was a small child, I've often tried to understand what it is that our veterans have gone through. What's it like in combat? What drives them? What makes it happen? And how is it that America wins so much? And now, decades later, I still don't have many of those answers. We gather today on the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, a war that saw the deaths of nine million people, including 116,000 American soldiers. In that war, we saw the introduction of the machine gun. And guys would dig trenches on both sides to avoid machine gun fire. Naturally, the trenches gathered water and they were squalid. They were horrible. The conditions were bad. And when they got the orders, our guys would go up over the trenches and run headlong into machine gun fire in an attempt to subdue a, a stubborn enemy. The carnage was so bad, the casualties were so bad, the deaths were so high, that after it was over, they called it the Great War and optimistically, the war to end all wars. Little did they know that less than four decades later, we'd be embroiled in another world war, much greater, much more deadly. Often as a child, I turned to the image of the flag raisers on Iwo Jima, an image that all of us have seen time and time again. The United States Marines attacked that island that was held by the Japanese, and it was an important objective. We needed it so our planes could land there and refuel before taking off to bomb Japan. Now at that time, the Japanese knew we were coming. They had dug in, they had tunnels, they had caves. They often waited for us to surpass the positions they were in so they could attack our boys from behind. And it was tough going. And finally, the Marines made it to the top of Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima. And a photographer and a video crew happened to be there as they raised that American flag. The photograph won a Pulitzer Prize. It's been featured on stamps. All of us have seen it time and time again. One of those flag raisers was a man named John Bradley from Anago, Wisconsin. Anago is a small town in northern Wisconsin, not altogether unlike Rochester. After the war, John Bradley refused to talk about what happened in combat. In fact, his son wrote a book called Flags of Our Fathers, primarily because he couldn't get from his dad what had happened there. He went to research his dad's military career. He had to do that to find the answers. John Bradley, of course, was famous as a flag raiser. And every year on the anniversary of the raising, he would instruct his son to stand by the phone and answer all the calls from newspapers across the country and simply say, my dad was out fishing. 
he could not stand to talk about it or even think about the horrors of combat in the Pacific. And while they told all the reporters he was out fishing, it was noted in the book that his dad never fished. <laughs> I felt a particular kinship to John Bradley as a child because my dad's from Antigo, Wisconsin. Everyone knew the family. They owned the Bradley Funeral Home. I still have extended family there. And in eighth grade, we took a trip to Washington, D.C. to see all the monuments, including the Marine Corps Monument, which is a statue of those men raising that flag on Iwo Jima. In fact, the base of the statue is made with rock from the mountain. And I took with me a comb that John Bradley had given a family member of mine, thinking somehow, someway, by owning a physical possession of his, that I would have some sort of insight into the bravery that he showed on that mountain. While I am in awe of John Bradley, and all the flag raisers, and all the Marines, and all the veterans who have fought, simply owning that comb did nothing for me. It gave me no insight. And in fact, it really didn't hit me till years later, when I met a veteran in Logansport by the name of Bob Crispin. Bob's still alive and he's a friend of mine, and he was drafted as a senior in high school in 1943, at age 19. He didn't finish his second semester. They sent him his diploma in the mail. They figured three and a half years of high school plus service in the Pacific was enough. One day I was able to sit down with Bob and have him tell me about his experience. He was on a ship and we were about to invade an island called Tarawa. He was about to go over the side at age 19 to assault the beach. When a small boat drove up and it had four Marines in it. Guys who had assaulted the beach in the first wave and who had been hit by artillery. The captain of that small boat was asking if anyone knew where a hospital ship was and of course no one did. The four casualties in that boat were covered with blood and sand. They were not likely to survive, especially since no one knew where a hospital boat was. You got to think, at age 19, just a little bit older than the kids in the band, looking over the ship and seeing men who were sure to die for lack of medical attention, seeing that gruesome sight and wondering, what would you think? Because shortly thereafter, his orders were to go over the side of that boat and to assault that same beach, to go on that same ground where those men had most likely lost their lives. And Bob, like so many other 19-year-old kids we sent to war, didn't question his orders. He went ahead and did it. And he fought for freedom and fought for this country. Like every veteran, he fought so that we could gather here today. He fought so that we could have our own opinions free from government interference. Like the pastor said, so that we could pray without anyone telling us that we're not allowed to. For every freedom we have and that we take for granted, these men fought. These men were injured. These men died. And so it has been in every conflict. I talked to a veteran from Korea. His strongest memory was when it was 60 degrees below zero, and still they had to stay and fight. Perhaps the most poignant memory of mine comes not from a veteran, but from a family member. Her name is Peggy Bannon. And she spoke to a high school not far from here about what it was like to be a family member of a serviceman who was drafted in order to be sent into combat. Wondering day in and day out, what is he suffering? What is he going through? Has he been injured? Has he been killed? And not knowing. Her husband fought in Vietnam. And during that conflict, they flew family members to Hawaii and brought their men on furlough out to see their families for six weeks. At the end of that six weeks, all the civilians had to get back on the plane and come home. And the men had to go back to combat. She said everyone on that plane was crying uncontrollably, howling for the fear that they had seen their husband or their brother or their son for the very last time. And for too many, that was true. It was the last time they saw their loved one alive. Every veteran of every conflict risks that for us, for people they don't know, for people they've never met. Today, we gather to thank all our Blue Star families, the 25 active servicemen and women from Fulton County. We honor the Gold Star families here who have lost loved ones in combat and ask that we remember them not just today, but every single day. On behalf of all, I thank you for gathering here to show your support and your gratitude for the many blessings our veterans have bestowed upon us. America is great because it is free, and America is free because of her veterans. If you have served, thank you all. Thank you, thank you Senator Head. That was very good and very inspiring. Ladies and gentlemen, we will will you please join us in our national anthem?
Thank you again, Ben. It's, uh, you guys do a wonderful job for us. Thank you. The Honor Guard, the honor guard will uh, now render the three volley salute followed by taps played by six members of the Rochester High School Band. Those members that are, will be playing the taps are Cheyenne White Knight, Martin Boardman, Connor Templeton, Zach Brown, Garrett Etchison, and Aaron Maple. I hope I got those all right. <laughs> Mr. Leibarger, will you please take command? Ladies and gentlemen, that now concludes our ceremony for the day. I do have an announcement in closing. There will be a chili served at the VFW Post 1440 or 1343 and the American Legion Post 36 immediately after the ceremony. All attending the ceremony are welcome to join us at no cost. Also, there will be a pork loin dinner served at the VFW Post 1343 after 4 p.m. or from 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. or until gone. Any and all veterans and their immediate family are welcome to come join in no cost. Any guests wishing to attend are also welcome for a donation. The VFW will also have a short a band by the name of Short Term Memories starting at 6 p.m. The public is welcome to come and enjoy the music. That concludes the program. Veterans, for the thank you for your service. Especially, I see a lot of veterans out here in the crowd. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your service. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. And you young people, thank you for attending. So, it's always nice to see your young faces out here. So, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it on my behalf. I uh, and as the, the being the commander of the post 1343.